So the final part of the video tutorial, we're going to talk about what do we do when we have uncertainties in our X and Y data points. So of course, typically in a physics experiment, um, we actually know an uncertainty in a value. So we make some measurements X and Y, and what we find is that we know that we have some degree of uncertainty. Um, now, actually, what you might have is some degree of uncertainty in both X and Y. Um, there are ways in Python that there are um, ways of doing curve fitting that can handle an uncertainty in X and an uncertainty in Y, but curve fit really only understands uncertainty in Y and not in X. So um, uh, if you have data where you have an uncertainty in X but not in Y, then you might have to go and do something like, for example, uh, invert the equation you're trying to fit. So instead of giving you y is f of x, it's instead is doing x is f of y, and you simply just swap x and y around in the curve fit. Alternatively, you might have to come up with some way of estimating what an uncertainty in y would look like, given you have an uncertainty in x. Okay, but how do we then actually go and do this? Well, so for this example, what we're going to do is we're going to um, create some non-uniform uh, noise in our data set. And specifically, I'm going to make the noise get bigger as we go from the left hand side to the right hand side. So I'm going to create a noise scale uh, array, um, which is just getting bigger linearly, um, going from one to ten. Um, uh, and um, I'm then going to uh, use that to go and uh, create some scaling. Um, uh, in a slightly complicated formula, that means I get a, a reasonable distribution of, of noise. So what I've done here is I then used that to go and scale the, the amount of random noise I'm adding to the data points. And I've also used that noise scale to go and show you the size of the error bars. And you can see as we go from the left to the right, the error bars are getting bigger. Um, OK, so now we can go off and uh, having plotted all of that, we can have a go at trying to actually go and fit the data. OK, so what we can do then is let's just start off fitting without making an allowance for those error bars. OK, so I, because only my um, fitting parameters are all back close to one, I don't need to supply a P0 in this particular case. So um, for our curve fit, I'm just running it with a fitting function, and then the X and the Y with the noise that's varying X as we go from left to right. And we plot it, we fit it, uh, and, and, and so on. And then we have a go at um, looking at what the results look like. And so again, we do the same table as we've done before. Um, and what you notice now is that the fitting is not as good. So in particular, the value of A um, now is coming out at 0 0.87, uh, whereas before we were 0 0.98, and the true answer is 1. And in fact, you can see we're now over two standard errors out um, on our um, value for A. Um, our value for B, on the other hand, has turned out to be remarkably close um, by random chance. And our values for omega-1 and omega-2, they've also got bigger. Um, and they're also now both more than one standard deviation. So we're now in a situation where three out of four of our parameters are wrong by more than one standard error. And that should start to throw up some warning signs that something is not right, because what we'd expect is that the fitting parameters, two out of three of them, should be less than one standard error from the true answer. But now we have three out of four of them are more than one standard error out. So that's telling us that um, although it's managed to fit, the extra scatter and the way the extra scatter is changing is causing the fit not to work so well. And what's going on here, and the reason this happens, is because curve fit is trying to fit the data at the right-hand side, where the error bars are large, as closely and as carefully as it's fitting at the left-hand side, where the errors are smaller. But if you were to look at this as a human, you'd sit there and say, but hang on a second here, the error bars at the right are bigger, and the noise at the right seems to be bigger as well. So therefore, if I don't get as close to my best fit straight line on the right hand side, that's OK. It's more important that I'm trying to make things fit better at the left hand side. 
where the error bars are smaller. But Curvefit doesn't know this. Curvefit knows nothing about your data other than it's a bunch of XY data points. And so it is trying to fit all of those X and Y data points equally well. And that's why your fitting is breaking down. So how do we get around this? So what we have to do is we have to tell Curvefit that the uncertainty with which it should treat the data points is changing as we go from left to right. And to do that, we use the sigma keyword parameter. And so what we can do here is I've just done the same thing. So I'm doing the same curve fit again, but I've now introduced this new sigma equals noise scale. So that noise scale, if you remember, that's the size of the error bars. Uh, and so those are getting bigger as we go from left to right. And what I'm doing is I'm telling curve fit, don't try so hard on the right, try harder on the left. And if we look at what is actually going done, again, the same table, the first column is the parameter it's found. Then we have the standard error. Then we have the true parameter. And then we have a thing which is telling us how many times the, the standard error are we away from the correct fit. And you can see that, well, it's better. Um, we now have uh, two out of four of the parameters are less than one standard uh, error away from the right answer. And then the first two parameters, well, they're still a bit more um, at 1.74 or 1.19. So it's, it's better. It has definitely got better. It's doing a better job of doing the FET. And again, you can see that those numbers, I mean, they are just closer um, to what was expected. What's actually going on here in the, the maths? What's the sigma actually doing? Well, if we go back to how the, um, the uh, curve fitting is being done, it's calculating this goodness of FET function. So the big F. And before what it was doing is it was just doing the square of the difference between the data point and the line it's calculating, and then summing those squares up and calling that the goodness of fit. And what we're now doing is we're going to weight those um, distances they are from the line by the um, size of the error bar that's associated with that data point. So in other words, the sigma parameter. So now we're weighting that, that calculation by the sigma. So where the error bars are large, the sigma is large, and therefore we um, reduce the amount that the, the difference you are from the line is in that area, uh, how much it contributes to the overall um, goodness of fit function that we're trying to find the minimum in. And so it makes those data points less important. OK. But that's actually all just a relative calculation. It's just telling us that relatively to pay less attention to the right hand side. But that's not always going to be quite what we want to go and do. So consider a set of data that looks like this. This should be roughly a straight line and it has some nice big chunky error bars on it. Now, if we would go and try and fit that data, we'd fit it with a straight line. Um, and we can do that with curve fit. So we can just create a straight line function, fit into curve fit with our data. And then it gives us some optimum parameters and some errors. And even though we have these quite large values of sigma, it's come back and told us that this is a perfect straight line with zero uncertainty in the gradient and the intercept. But how can that be the case? We've got these big error bars here. And if we were to go and do this manually, um, like just drawing a graph and, and so on, well, yes, you probably would draw the same best fit straight line to all the data points. But you would also go and say, but yeah, but with these error bars, actually the gradient could be anything in between the two dashed lines that I've drawn here, where you get the, the dashed lines still go through the error bars, um, but they've certainly not got, um, uh, they've got differences in the, in the gradient. And that implies that there should be an error and uncertainty in the gradient, but that's not what curve fit found. And the reason that's the case is because the uncertainties we've told curve fit about are all the same size. And so when it calculates the, um, the, the goodness of fit function and it normalizes the distance from the straight line by the sigma, the sigmas are all the same. So all the data points count exactly the same and in fact, that's going to end up doing the same sum as when we didn't provide any sigma at all. And it counted all the data points as exactly equally valid. So we need to be able to go and tell curve fit 
hang on a second here, these aren't just telling you about the relative weights of these data points, they're actually telling you about the uncertainty we've got in the data points being in those coordinates at all. Um, and so we need to go and do that. And the way we do this is with another keyword parameter called absolute sigma. And if absolute sigma is true, then what we're saying is not only is the sigma telling you about the relative importance of each data point in, the, in your curve fit, it's also telling you about how confident we are that that data point is in fact in the right place at all. And that doesn't change the optimal parameters. You still get the same optimal parameters, so the three and the minus four in this case, but what it does change is how it treats the covariance matrix. And now it understands that the variances should be related to the size of the error bars you've given it. And so what you see coming out of the fit is it now actually puts some uncertainty in both the intercept and the gradient. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay, so doing this is now actually giving us a realistic uncertainty in those fitting parameters. So in a physics world, we nearly always have absolute sigma equals true. Our uncertainties are, are uh, how much do we care about these data points are nearly always really to do with how accurately do we think a data point is measured rather than just relatively how important do we think it is. So most of the time when you're doing uh, curve fitting, you will have absolute sigma equals true if you've supplied a, a, a idea of the uncertainties. Okay, so back to our um, uh, wiggly line fit. Let's now do the curve fit again, but this time we're going to add absolute sigma equals true. And again, the actual values of the fit we found won't have changed because changing absolute sigma from true to false or false to true doesn't change the values you find for the optimum parameters, but it does change the covariance matrix and therefore it changes the standard error in your optimum parameters that you've found. So if we look at that table, we can now see that um, it has indeed gone and changed the um, the, the, the size of those uncertainties. And in fact, it's made those uncertainties get a little bit smaller. So by telling it that these are actually real error bars, it's gone away and it's actually decided that the uncertainties it had found are in fact a little bit smaller now. Uh, sorry, the uncertainties are a little bit bigger. And so the, um, get this the right way around, the difference between the true value and the, and the optimum value, when you divide it by the uncertainty, uh, because the uncertainty has got a bit bigger, the number of standard errors you are away from um, the, uh, the the true value has gone down a little bit. So in fact, the fit's got better because we've made the uncertainties in our parameters a bit bigger. Um, so that might be a bit of a sort of counterintuitive logic, but um, when you're doing curve fitting of, of data, then even, yes, you want um, a well-defined optimum value, but you actually mainly what you want to do is know that the optimum value plus the uncertainty you've found in it are correctly encompassing the true value um, uh, within at least the normal range of expected uh, variation. Okay, so that's now meant that we've, we've improved our estimate of the uncertainties and therefore we've got now the relative difference um, from the true answers is now was 1.7 times the uncertainty. It's now only 1.56 times the uncertainty, 1.6 times the uncertainty. Before it was 1.17, now it was 1.08, I guess. Well, yeah. Um, and the other two have also dropped slightly because the uncertainty's got a little bit bigger because we're estimating it more correctly. Final point. If we actually zoom in on those um, uh, plots we've shown the best fit straight line and our data points and our errors, you'll notice that in fact, our best fit straight line is not going through the error bar in all cases. So there are several data points there where the um, error bar misses the best fit straight line. And the question you wanna ask is, well, is this a problem? And the answer is no. 
This is in fact exactly what you would expect. Again, remember the error bar, um, particularly because I know I added the noise in by adding an all distribution of noise. The error bar on your data point is the standard deviation of the um, data point of, of the of the um, the range of values you might expect from for, for that individual data point. So we've got to think is although we've found some data point here, what we're saying by putting an error bar there is we accept that if we were to measure this data point lots and lots and lots of times, we would get different values because we have some degree of uncertainty in our measurement and even intrinsic uncertainty in the actual thing we're measuring. Um, and so if we were to build up a histogram of all the values we measure, that would have some kind of width of distribution. And if we assume that that histogram would basically look like a normal distribution, then the width we're talking about is the standard deviation of that distribution. That's the size of our error bar. But as we just said, in a normal distribution, only two thirds of the area in a normal distribution is within one standard deviation of the, of the middle of it. So in other words, one third of our data points ought to lie off the line of best fit, otherwise something's gone wrong. Um, and again, this is actually a test of, of whether your uncertainties are, are kind of being done correctly. If you find that your line goes through all of the uh, error bars without exception, then it probably means your error bars are a bit wrong. They're probably a bit too big. If your line goes through only a quarter of the error bars, then it's probably telling you your error bars are a bit too small. Um, so, um, or, or alternatively, that your errors are not following a normal distribution, which is also possible. Um, but most of the time, errors follow a normal distribution, and therefore your best fit line should pass through two thirds of your error bars. If we actually calculate uh, the distance of our, each data point from the line of best fit um, and make a little histogram of that, then you get something which looks like this. And you can see that in this case, yes, the, the, um, the line of best fit um, gets very close to all the data points on average. So on average, that histogram is pretty close to zero, but there is a finite width to that histogram, meaning there are some data points that are more than two error bars away from the line. You know, the fact you've got some counts uh, beyond plus two and beyond minus two is telling you there are a small number of data points that are a long way from the best fit straight line, but also telling you that most of them are between zero or around about zero to one away from the, the best fit straight line.